Actung, actung, it's James Holland here. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. This is part two of my conversation with the amazing, incredible Robin Rowlands. And for those of you who listened to the first one, you'll remember that he had just been talking about his respect for the Japanese dead uh, and their astonishing loyalty to their emperor. Anyway, here's part two. That was end of the, the, the end, really for us, the end of the Kohima. And uh, we were... The whole division was billeted. The whole of Seven Div came back to Kohima. Uh, the monsoon ended in August. I went on a... Co- uh, uh, we were recuperating, put it that way. And when you recuperate, you do all sorts of things. I was sent on a course a, a called a junior tactical course to Dehradun. And that was a good course. There's no doubt about that it was uh, in in... July. Uh, was, that, was that for a different type of fighting that was anticipated in that was to come in Burma? Yes. Oh yes, yes it was, because <laughs> unknown to us the war the war went on and Arakan was still they were still marching forward in Arakan and no doubt the conditions there were much the same as they always were at the end of the Kohima and the Japs had gone. We knew that the next job would be in the scrub country. No jungle at all. More mobile, more, very much more open, and enough to build a, an airstrip for a small aircraft. But were you conscious that you'd just been part of a great victory? Yes, I think we were at that stage, but just how big, I don't think the extent of it really, because we, I mean, I can see the plan of the Japs, but I couldn't see it then. Their object, there were two ways into India uh, to beat these the British, and one was through Imphal. And you will take Imphal because the road from Imphal to Kohima is metal. And it will take tanks, it will take armoured cars, it will take everything. Once you get there, all you've got to do is to meet up with Sato's forces, who will have taken Kohima, and the road to India is then open. Well, they failed at Imphal, and that's why when you first came in today, you told me that someone had designated Imphal Kohima as the greatest battle of the war. I suppose it will always be a matter of discussion as to whether there was a degree of uh, uh, between Kohima and Imphal. I think Kohima was crucial, there's no question about it. If they had gone then I think India would have gone. Uh, but it did depend, uh, from the Jap point of view, in getting Imphal. But they, managed, they held them back at Imphal. And I met some of my friends back in Northern Ireland had been in the Imphal thing, and they told me about it, how they did it. But I didn't know the full extent of the battle down there, but it was pretty severe, wasn't it? Would you have any judgment on that yourself, about, from what you know of reports? I think Slim anticipated what the Japanese were trying to do. He underestimated the thrust up to Kohima, which was supposed to sweep Kohima aside and then go on to Dimapur. Absolutely. The danger really was if it got to Dimapur, then there'd have been a problem because they then would have been able to attack all those supply bases. And the metal road would have been open for vehicles, tanks, a lot. But but it was superbly fought by by Slim and he did reinforce Kohima just in the nick of time. He and, did. You know, and he acted quickly and, the, and the, the interplay between ground forces and the air transports and, and what was going on in the sky yeah. was really tight. I mean, Slim really got that operational level really cleverly. And what he was trying to do with Imphal was do a fighting retreat from up the Tidim Road from the Shenham Saddle and all the rest of it towards Imphal where obviously his supply lines were getting shorter and the Japanese were getting longer. So the idea was to, although to pull back, was to degrade the Japanese as they pulled back, mm-hmm. then reinforce and then counterattack, which is broadly what happened. Just that there was this moment of extreme jeopardy, of course. At, at yes, Kohima, at Kohima. It was just a brilliantly fought battle that was making the most of understanding your enemy and how they were likely to behave. Yeah, they did it in the end. Because well, I think I'm right in saying that uh, Slim had, or somebody had at one thought, of defending Dimapur. I may be wrong in that, but I have a feeling it was, it may have been from his autobiography I got that, I'm not sure. 
But anyway, there was some talk, but then they very quickly realised, as you say, that Kohima was going to be the thing, and that's when they brought Seven Div up from. That's a very good example of what it was like being a com relatively junior officer in the Indian Army, in action against the enemy, not knowing what was going on elsewhere, or even what the plan was. If the colonel said, we've got to attack that hill tomorrow morning, I want A and B companies to prepare a plan and attack it, that's all you knew, and you did it. But you had no idea who was on your left or anything about it. And that's all you can see, and that's why there's not a, hardly a jot in the battalion history of what happened in Arakan, because um, the hills, Italy, Abel, Cain, Boomerang, were all separate hills, and uh, no one able to write out in battalion, the chief clerk couldn't write out, today a company did so, <laughs> nothing, nothing at all. But you were there and you knew what was happening at your, um, uh, on your particular day. I won't even say front because it wasn't even the front as you and I know it. It was just a, a small battle and the Japs had to be got off it. So you went on your course and you're learning a different type of, of warfare. Yes, we did. We did. Uh, then we went, uh, I went on the, uh, the tactical, then I went back to Kohima and the seven div, by now at Kohima the plans had been formulated from a grand scale of what we were going to do. We were going to go down through Imphal, down to Tidim and into Burma and we were going to reach the Irrawaddy and we were going to, we were on the attack now, not defending. It was the Japs who were now defending. And we were going to go down and cross the Irrawaddy and defeat them uh, that way. And in order to defeat them, it would mean you'd really have to kill them in battle. They weren't going to surrender, the Japs never did. And so it went on. And, and that, that tactical course was, was quite good. But I remember they had a, there were three brigades in 7 Div and they had exercise, military exercises before we went down. Faith, hope and charity were the names of the three exercises. They lasted about three days each and again one didn't really know the extent of what was going on. You knew that you were given a task to do in this exercise, you would move from A to B. But it was all very useful and uh, they were very successful and if you we were going on patrol you blackened your face and you carried your rifle or whatever weapon you had and all the rest of it and uh, and so we, we got so we went down uh, we had um, we went down at the beginning of uh, December so that means we were in Kohima September October November four months refitting getting reinforcements back from India getting new officers in to replace the old ones. Uh, the new colonel was making his way into his new command, main prize king. They called him, uh, the troops had a name for our new colonel, it was Darty Farty because he was a very spruce individual. <laughs> very deceptive, he was a very good officer, but he was always very well turned out. And that's what he... <laughs> Great name. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they, they came down and the, the, uh, we moved down. So if we leave Kohima behind, and really that's all there is, I've described it, the conditions. I don't think it's possible to say how frightful Kohima was as a result of that battle. It really was dreadful. And the... the, the dead bodies that had been buried all over the place, civilians. And the Nagas were extremely helpful to us in, from intelligence point of view, very helpful. It was the first Queens who took jails, uh, Jail Hill. It was the 4th 15th Punjab who did the frontal attack on Church Knoll, both of which failed because it was a frontal attack. And it was the 4th 1st Gurkhas who captured it with uh, Horsford. So then we go down, and we're a now reconnaissance battalion, and we are trained that. And uh, we go down to a place called Calamio, which is down through the Cabal Valley, uh, in a very, very malaria-ridden spot. Is this beyond Tidim? Yes, it is beyond Tidim. It's quite a way down, actually. Have you crossed the Chinduin at this point? 
No, we never did cross the Chinwin. No, we we struck out towards the Irrawaddy, Pakoku. That's right. The map wouldn't tell you why. It was just the way we took our job. The uh, seven div were were to advance to the Chinwin uh, by the seventh of January or some date like that. And our job as a battalion was to cover the left hand flank. And as you quite rightly point out, we were in scrub country. Absolutely. Uh, one rather interesting little episode does reflect on me a bit, but quite favourably was. Part of our training as reconnaissance battalion was to build airstrips. We were told how to build an airstrip because the light plane was going to be the only communication with Div headquarters and, and uh, uh, brigade headquarters. So we, I was taught, and we got... Uh, when we moved forward on the left flank, marching, the first scrub country we came to was a place called Kuzai, K-U-Z-E-I-K. And unfortunately, there'd been a supply drop in the wrong place. <laughs> I don't know how they managed that. I, you'll never, we'll never know, but they did. They dropped a supply of everything at Kuzai when battalion had moved on two days covering the left flank. I was ordered to stay behind as OC rear details at this place. And the first thing I did was I got a hold of the villagers and made them build an airstrip for me, which all it entailed was cutting a hedge down and levelling out a few ground, ending up with about 250 yards of uh, flat country. On the very first morning after the uh, mistaken airdrop, a uh, an L5, a light airplane, came in in thick fog and landed on my airstrip. I had to light bonfires on the edge of it to let him see where to land part of our training, what I'd been told to do. Out stepped this rather spruce young man called Edwards. I can never, I'll never forget his name. And he came up to me and said, Hi, and he said, you want to flip? And I thought, yeah, that would be a good idea. Now, I had no idea where my battalion headquarters was. I had no idea where any of my companies were. And I was left with a three days supply of ammunition, food and everything. And I, was, and I was about to do that when uh, I discovered that there were six elephants marched into my camp at Kuzai. Six elephants with one Burmese, uh, they, in India they call them Mahout, in Burma they call them some Uzi, an Uzi. Six elephants. So here was my answer. <laughs> but I didn't know where the battalion were. So I said to Ed, Edwards, uh, can you, um, have you, you've got a radio? Yeah. What frequency do you broadcast on? And he gave me the frequency. And I, I said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go and find out one of my companies and try and find battalion headquarters. And I, have you got a message thing? Yes. It's a, a, a satchel with a leaded weight on it. And I wrote out two attacks. The first one I saw was spotted Rupert, who commanded C Company. I saw, we came across him, we took off, and flew at about, what, a thousand feet, maybe something like that. Saw Rupert, and I dropped the first message over the side of the aircraft. Saw him pick it up, where is battalion headquarters? And he did went like that, up a nala bed, up a river bed, dried up river bed, like that. So we went round, he pointed the plane and Edwards saw it. In a few minutes we came across battalion headquarters, circled round, I dropped a mail bag over the side from the division from division. And on tied to it I said, on receipt of this, immediately open a 22 set on a frequency of 74 megacycles. 
and we watched, saw John pick up the thing, read it. When he was the signals officer, and in no time at all, we were in radio contact with my battalion headquarters. And I said, I'm stuck at Kuzite. I've got six elephants uh, by sheer chance. I will leave tomorrow morning, but it will take me three days to reach you. I saw him pick up this message and that was it. And then we flew off. And on the way back to my uh, place at Kuzaik in the air at 3,000 feet, Edward switched on the radio for the ink spots. And I was listening to the ink spots <laughs> at 3,000 feet over the Burmese jungle. <laughs> the Colonel must have been absolutely having kittens. He was commanding a battalion. He had missed an airdrop. He had, it was miles away back behind him. He had no radio. I had no radio. How am I going to get this bloody stuff up? How am I going to get it up? And then this solitary aircraft appears out of the blue, saved by the bell. And he was, uh, he, he was good enough to give me a good mention at the following orders group the next day. He said something like, uh, that's what showing initiative means, something like that. What you were saying about luck. Well, it's luck. Another very good example of it, pure luck. I, was, I couldn't find six elephants anywhere. I didn't even know they were there. They'd been working for the Japs three days previously, probably. So anyway, that was very successful. We eventually mounted up and down we went to Pococo. And this was this is when you were all uh, with four corps and you were all... This was four corps. This was part of deception. And uh, we went down and got to the... Just before... Pococo is on the Irrawaddy, if you look at the map. Uh, and we were given the task of of capturing it and we had to get it by a certain day. We were moving pretty fast over the scrub country. But did you know the whole point was that this was a deception plan? No, I didn't know that. Didn't the no, the first time I, the first time was very interesting. I'll tell you in a minute about that, uh, about when I first knew that. Um, we went on and uh, we got, uh, just before Pokoku, we hit a Japanese hold up uh, group at a place called Bajigubin and uh, at that and I was Keith McCutcheon commanding B Company was held up by quite heavy fire from around the village area and uh, it took three days to clear that but in the meantime the colonel told me to take the mortars up and give them uh, help. I took my mortar platoon up and uh, parked it in a a, a very tiny reverse slope is the only one I could find, which proved very fortunate, because I, I, I hope not. And I had no information of what was happening at the Keith's front, but someone said that the Japs were using the pagoda as a, an OP. So I concentrated on the pagoda, and to cut a story short, I got a direct hit on that and dropped a, fired a whole lot of mortar bombs at 2,800 yards or something and uh, smoke arose from the, that and away it went and the next day Keith attacked and the Japs retreated beyond beyond the Irrawaddy. They went about five miles it was from Majigabin to Pokoku is five miles. The Japs pulled out. In the meantime they had opened up a 75 millimeter gun on my mortars and I was fortunately put them on a reverse slope. So you can imagine the reverse slope there, the shells were going over and exploding beyond the mortars. Sheer luck. <laughs> Not, I wasn't the great, the most brilliant tactician the world has ever seen. But also well placed. They're well placed, well, well placed. Well placed. And of course I was out in front of them trying to direct the, the, the fire of the, the mortars. And, but they, I think the 75 millimeter, the 70 millimeter Japanese gun could outstrip my mortars by a bit. I think they had a range greater than mine. So I don't think I hit anything worth talking about. But I did set this damn village on fire. 54 years later I went back and I told you the story how I went back uh, on a holiday cruise up the Irrawaddy, went back, got out at Pococo and uh, went back to see the damage that I had done 
54 years before the war. But when we got to Pococo, the first time I knew that there was a reception plan, when the colonel called me from my bed at 11 p.m., he said, you are to take the mortar platoon and fire off every bomb you've got. I said, what's the target? He said, there isn't a target. Fire them off at random into the middle of the river. There's, a, there's an island in the river, a big island. So I thought this was great. I got the platoon out and we fired off every bomb we had. <laughs> and I said, what's the point? And somebody said, uh, the agent or someone, that they, it was deception. We wanted the Japs to think that the crossing was going to take place at a place other than where they actually were. And where the division actually crossed at Mieche was about uh, 15 miles downriver from where I was. But that night we, we fired off, I don't know, about maybe 200 bombs. And that suddenly the night was filled with exploding mortar bombs. And that was my part in a, a slim, uh, brilliant defence <laughs> deception plan. <laughs> so then uh, we were there. I, I then was detached from my battalion. They had stayed in Pococo, where they'd captured it. But I was given a, a task. I got command of A Company by now. I was promoted. And I was given command of A Company. And I was detached uh, duty uh, and was told to go across the river and go down, uh, cross onto the other side. By now it was the beginning of Feb, February, and the Japanese had decided, the big decision, that they were going to defend Burma from the East Bank, not the West Bank, which meant they'd cross the river. But the thing they didn't know, as you have known very well from your knowledge, where are the British going to cross the river? Mm. Are they going to cross up at Mandalay or are they going to cross somewhere else? They didn't know. Well, we're going to take a short break now, but see you all in a minute. Well, welcome back to this final part of our two-day special with Robin Rowland. Here he is. I was, uh, I was given command of a, company, of a Company, and I was told to detach from the battalion and go on a reconnaissance expedition for the brigade right away down in the front line between a place called Chokpadong uh, and, and the other. And my, uh, I had my company, and it really was pretty scrubbed out. If you look at, the, if you could see the map, you'd see a road running south from uh, near Pagan, near Pagan, Mieche is where they crossed, uh, where the division crossed, going south there. And that was, I think I'm pretty sure it was metalled at the time. And I was about 25 miles down there. And my, the, the, object of my orders of I was given my brigade was to find out to what extent the Japanese were using a road running across the front 30 miles from the river uh, which meant that uh, it was all reconnaissance and so I then, presumably if they were using it then you would well, I'd have to report back to my, yes and say what strength they were in and all the rest it was really a reconnaissance patrol which after all was part of our job as a reconnaissance battalion. I, I, I got down there and I, had to, I was taking over from another uh, officer of the 4th, 5th Gurkhas who said he'd been occupying the hill, I always sees the high ground, he said. Well, of course, I followed his example. I said, right, we'll dig in up there. And it was, I can, it was, if you had a one inch map or Less of the place, it was 0.1186, I can remember it. And we were shelled for three nights up there. I was there with a the radio and they had a, I was given a, a thing called Slidex, which is a cipher, a code thing. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't think our people would have much trouble in breaking that code, but anyway, it was a code. 
And I had a slip trench and I slept in a slip trench there. And for three nights we were attacked. And I, I, I was the only English speaking officer in the company then, fluently anyway. And Brigade decided to pass me a message uh, in code when I was in a sleep trench in the middle of an attack. And we were, we were absolutely uh, invulnerable. I mean, we had the high ground and we had bread guns and we had everything. There's no one could have taken that hill from us. We were well dug in, but they did attack. And I, I was lying in a slip trench and I covered it with a, with a blanket. And I couldn't, it was, the person who was passing the message was just an ordinary uh, radio operator, wireless operator, maybe a private soldier probably. And I could just say, look, I'm in the middle of an attack. Would you, would you pass this message later? I can't do anything now. Well, there's nothing I could do. The attack was going on and there's nothing I could do. I couldn't get up and run around. <laughs> And I just sat there in the trench with these bloody guns going on. Eventually I got it. And the I always remember the way the, the, the message ended. The part of it was in code, but the end of it was in clear. And it said, and report to this headquarters the steps you take to achieve this end. That was okay. We, uh, so you it, saw off of the attack? Oh, yes, we did. No trouble at all, yes. And it was a kind of a mixed attack of... Uh, Japanese and uh, what do they all call those other Japanese GIFs, yeah. the Japanese Interior Force. And we got a number of dead bodies on the perimeter in the morning and told them to bury them somewhere. And uh, that three nights running that took place. And the gun, I don't know where the gun was, it was miles, quite a long while away. And it, but we weren't hit, that was the beauty. We were not hit once. So, uh, it wasn't on a reverse, we weren't, we weren't on the reverse slope this time, but they didn't hit us, so I have no idea of where they were. It also entailed, uh, next day, I got, well, I had word with my company uh, platoon commander, and I told him what our task was, to go to, uh, patrol down to the road. I'd go myself, except that I had to wait in case some wireless messages came in. And I was the only English speaking one there. So anyway, he got, he selected one of his corporals uh, and dressed him up in Burmese clothing, took his uniform off, put a lunji chong on, and uh, he went, uh, he went down a good 20 miles south to this road. And no, uh, as a, as a, a Burmese civilian, they were very good of him, I must say. And he uh, uh, watched the vehicle, how much traffic there was going between Chunk Padong and this other place. It was all very useful. And uh, eventually, uh, I found myself also, once on that, our telephone lines began to be cut by the Japs at night. They would cut them at night because we were so far forward. And uh, on one occasion, uh, I found myself being OP, uh, observation post for uh, the 25 pounders who were back, a couple of miles back. And I was directing their fire because I was the only officer available at that point. And I, I had a, their telephone line, I had somehow or other hooked up to their telephone line and I was directing fire onto the Japanese positions which were way in front of me. And that, that was all right, we, we got it. It shows you the variation you have to be uh, ready for at any moment in a situation like that, improvise all the time. And uh, the General uh, Evans of Italy sent for me uh, he was moving forward. He's, uh, he said, you have to report to the general. He wants to speak to you about water. So he said, I went into his caravan. He said, look here, you've been operating in these, this, these, uh, this area for quite some time now. What about the water tanks for my troops are coming up and for the, for the tanks and all this? 
So I told him where the various, I was able to tell him where the various water tanks were, the natural ones that the villagers used. So that's another example. <laughs> How he got to here, well, I suppose he'd asked someone, has anybody been operating in this area that knows it? And word got around that I'd been operating, and that's why he sent for me. That was it. So that was the, really that. And um, then it was after that our task was really a bit uneventful. We covered the, the left flank right down through the oil fields, Yen and Yang. Uh, and we were in, saw the new, the division pressed on. We had no more direct action in the nature of things. We were a Cossack battalion, and as far as the rest of the uh, division were concerned, I don't think they had very many other frontal attacks def uh, against defended features. It was more open warfare, and, and we, we got to Pegu eventually when the, um, we had uh, the atomic bombs were dropped, brought the war to an end. There were, with us in my battalion, we had two American chaps from what they called a light aid detachment, LAD, which was medical, but they were American. And one of them came into breakfast at Pegu one morning and said, I, I, I heard on the news this morning, they're talking about some bomb. And so we looked at them and said, w w what do you mean? Well, he says there's a lot of talk about some bomb has been dropped in Japan. And that's all we know about it. And we followed it up, and sure enough, it was the first atomic bomb that fell on, on, on Hiroshima. And he had been listening into his, uh, his own network, the American network, and he, we were the first to hear of the volume. And of course, to our utter astonishment and joy, the second one fell on Nagasaki, and that, and that brought it to an end, the Japs. So can you remember where you were when you heard the news? That was at Pegu. Some mile, uh, Rangoon had think was either about to fall or had fallen by then. I think it had. A wild celebrations. Wild celebration, yeah. It really, it was a great thing because uh, we were later uh, we were due to go in. The first country we were going to invade after Burma was Malaya, and we were going to go in at Port Swetland. I kind of remember the name of the oper operation. Not, I can't remember what it was, but that would have been a costly one with the Japanese. It would have been. You obviously fought a lot of your men. Thought a lot of them. They were very, very good indeed. Very good. It's one thing I learned very soon. Uh, perhaps understood is a better word. Uh, especially in Arakan and afterwards at Kohima and Burma. As a company commander or a platoon commander, whichever it is, don't ever ask your men to do something you wouldn't do yourself. That was absolutely crucial, because they looked up to you as a leader and as someone that they could trust. That was it. We got one chance to have a go at the Japs at a little village. My word came through that there were Japanese in a village called Tibu and Dahatsi. Two villages. I looked at my mind, oh well. And this was from, from brigade. There are Japanese reported in these. So I said, right, we'll have a go at them. So instead of sticking on top of the hill, I got A and B, I got two, I got my three platoons together. I got the Subedar, my second command said, we're going to have a go at the Japs at these two villages. And we got there and they performed brilliantly. We had a, two platoons up and one in reserve and I was with them and we marched there. And, and they were so keen to get into grips with the Japs, they just rushed to an empty village. The Japs had gone. <laughs> and it, you know, they, they were ready for them. My goodness, they, would have, they were so keen. So you've got this samurai sword. What's the story behind that? After the war, we were sent, first of all, we went to Malaya. And uh, that's where we were. And I, uh, the, the weeks rolled on. And one of the jobs I got was to go up to a place called Ubon. Oh yes, we went to Bangkok, that was it. We were ended up in Bangkok as a, uh, occupation troops. And uh, one day I got an order from the colonel, you are to go up to a place called Ubon, which is a way up 
near where the railway, the infamous railway was up there on the borders between there and Vietnam. You are to collect the arms of the 22nd Japanese Division, collect all their arms and bring them down to uh, Bangkok. So I got my company, we went up by train, we went to the river and I collected the arms and in the middle and what part of the arms I was given this samurai sword and it's still a very sharp and that was one of the arms that came out of the Ubon, the 22nd Division. It's given all their other military equipment. And then you got home in... So that was that and then, uh, yes, uh, we were in Malaya, yes, we left Bangkok and the final posting was to Malaya. First of all, away up north, uh, still in occupation troops. And the situation in Malaya was then, the war had ended, but the, the Chinese communists were a thorn in the flesh. And they became, for the next three years, long after I left, the communists were uh, a, a military target. And I think it was Dempsey or somebody was sent out to cure them. But we were there. And uh, they were, it was quite an extraordinary thing. We were quartered in tents just outside Kuala Lumpur. And my had a big, what they call an EPIP tent, which was a big sort of tent that you might use for a wedding reception, something almost as big as that, not quite. I was on the periphery of our lines and some of the, the locals or whoever it was, I don't know, they came out one night while I was still sleeping inside and removed the walls of the tent without my knowing. <laughs> and I woke up in the morning on my camp bed, exposed to all the world, there's a sob. <laughs> I came home in September 46, and in uh, October, beginning of October, I'd gone back to my law lectures at Queen's. What a, what a contrast. Someone's often asked me, well not often, but occasionally someone has asked me, how can you possibly fight the Japs or the Communists in September and listen to a law lecture in, 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 in the next month? Well, do you know what the answer to that is? A, I suppose I don't know, but secondly, my life was beginning again. I had to have a career. And you leave the the army is history, the war is history, to a point, and now you've got to look ahead and, and get you get your qualification if you're going to make a career of the law, and that's exactly what why I did it. And I went back to Queens, and there were one or two other people who'd been in Europe, in 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 the army, not many, mind, because there was no conscription in Northern Ireland, and we were all volunteers. When I went back, the university couldn't do enough for me. If you had served in the war at Queen's, they even gave me a grant for my tuition and all the rest of it. Gave me a grant and uh, I did, I was given credit for the one year that I'd already done before I went away, five years before. And I did two years at Queen's passed my degree and qualified as a barrister and the rest they say is what happened. Well, quite right too. But I was very, it was a great thing, that the, if anybody asked me what the best years of my life were, well, those five years were the best, the most formative of my life, definitely, no doubt. Northern Ireland at the age of 19, 20, very green, very inexperienced, didn't get out about the world very much to see what was going on. But once I reported at the guards depot at Caterham, that was the day it started. Met other people, commandos, colonels, people who'd been in the war, uh, and really, and you try to keep up with them, really, yeah. Amazing what you did. Absolutely, a very amusing part of it was when we got, when we got aboard the, the, uh, the ship, the Strathnaver at Greenock to join the convoy, the, we were cadets, one half grade above a private soldier with little white strips. We were given the, tour, the old tourist lounge and above 
me uh, was this chap who'd been in the army 12 months, he was I.O. And that was my first experience of what I shall term, well, naughty songs are, are well, you, you could think of a better word, I'm sure you could, but, but he, he introduced me to, I mean, I won't repeat the whole, I took my girl for a ramble, a ramble, down a shady lane, she caught her foot on a bramble, a bramble, an arse over bollocks she came, and I didn't say the rest of it, that was the first one I heard, and of course, that's what I mean, getting out into the world. You know, meet people from all sorts. Meet people from all sorts of life. And it just went from all then. We had many of those in, my, in our own mess night. They were purely morale-boosting songs. I mean, some of them were quite filthy, but they, they weren't in a word like that. They, for us, they were just natural morale-boosting songs. And obviously it worked. The outside world would regard them as... <laughs> really forbidden, <laughs> and I suppose you wouldn't you wouldn't sing them at a dinner party or anything like that. But uh, they helped us enormously. <laughs> but that was it. I came back five years later. I came back having commanded a company against the Japanese. So that I thought that was credentials enough. Well, that's it. Thank you all very much for listening. Cheerio and do tune in for the rest of our VJ Day 75th anniversary commemoration specials. Cheerio. Cheerio.